Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And welcome to the 2020 annual meeting of the Aspetuck Land Trust, our first virtual meeting ever. Who could have imagined this? While our board is going to miss eating Skinny Pines pizza and drinking Aspetuck Brew, Brew Lab beer with uh, all of you and visiting with all of you as well, we're going to have a productive meeting nonetheless. COVID-19 has affected all of us in one way or another. Some of us have been ill, some of us have lost people that we've known, and some of us have lost people that we've loved. This has been and continues to be a tragedy that we're all doing our best to overcome. At the same time, many of us have had to adapt to a new reality, including a more virtual world, and most of us have done this successfully. The Alt Board has met twice by video in the last couple of months to work with David and the staff to chart our course through COVID-19, and it worked well, and we've made good decisions. Chief among them was keeping our preserves open when other land trusts and governments closed theirs. Let me say that again. We kept our preserves open when other land trusts and governments closed theirs. The feedback from you, our supporters, has been warm and enthusiastic. And we're very pleased to have been there, offering a safe place to take refuge and to recreate during the worst of the crisis. Your board is meeting immediately after we finish here tonight to continue charting that course so that we can all continue to have safe access to our preserves. For those of you who are interested in access for dogs, that will be part of our conversation and we'll communicate our plans in the next couple of weeks. Before we get on with the business of the meeting, we're gonna take a look back at what our land trust has done in the last 12 months and take a moment to honor the memory of Bruce LePage. First, the land trust completed the acquisition and preservation of Gilberti's Farm, one of our premier target properties in our Green Corridor Initiative. This is a great accomplishment that took an extraordinary effort by our staff and the land acquisitions committee, as well as the generosity of you, our supporters to make happen. It looked financially daunting at the outset, but we overcame all the obstacles and closed the deal in the middle of a recession. Again, a great accomplishment that David will cover further. Next, we continued down to nail down the funding that will allow us to acquire to permanently preserve the uh, Fromson Strassler property in Weston. This 85 acre property is another essential building block in our Weston Wilton Forest Block Initiative, a green corridor focus area. David will tell you more about that as well. Speaking of Green Corridor, our homeowner engagement activities, a big element of our program, ramped up significantly this year, led by Mary Ellen LeMay. The warm reception to our efforts has been terrific. And tonight, Doug Tallamy will share more thoughts with us on what we can do as individuals to improve biodiversity in our own yards, a conversation that he started with us last fall as the 2019 Haskins Lecture, and we warmly welcome him back. Before, before we get on with the rest of the program, we want to take a moment to honor our former board member and executive director, Bruce LePage, who died in May. David is going to lead us in paying tribute to Bruce. David? Thanks, Bill. Hi, everyone. Many of you know me. Many of you, some of you don't. My name is David Brandt. I'm the executive director of Aspetuck Land Trust. Well, I've always said that land doesn't preserve itself, people preserve land. And we lost one of these people recently with the passing of Bruce LePage in May. When I was hired as executive director in 2008, Bruce drove me around in his truck to literally every single one of Aspetuck Land Trust's 150 properties. I almost got car sick multiple times from all of the stopping and the starting and the U-turns and the more stopping and the more starting and the more U-turns. I remember him telling me that he hoped someday I would remember these properties if I had to go back to them someday. And I did. Many times. Bruce was on the Aspetuck Land Trust Board of Directors when he took the executive director job in 1993 when he retired from IBM. I think he was happy to not go back and forth into the city on the train every day. He told me it was the best retirement job anyone could ever have. Before he died, he sent our former president, Princey Falkenhagen, who's now in Washington State and who was involved in that effort when she was president of the board, a letter and told Princey that 
saving Charles Brook Valley <clears throat> was the best thing he ever did in his life. It certainly was the biggest thing Aspetuck Land Trust had done up until that time. And Bruce made a go of it and he made it happen along with the board. During COVID-19, as Bill said, we kept our preserves open. And Troutburg Valley, as always, in COVID and non-COVID times, was the most popular property for the general public. We came from far and wide. We've never received, I have never received, so many positive messages from the public who were so happy that they had a place to go and feel normal again. I sent, a note to, I sent a note to the LePage family and included all these letters and said they were really writing to Bruce for saving this land back in 1999. And that's what I really felt when I read every single one of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bruce made a difference in our landscape and he had fun doing it. I'm having fun too. It's not my retirement job, but maybe when I retire, I'll continue. <laughs> I, had big, I had big shoes to fill in Bruce, and I am still filling them. He will be missed, but he will not be forgotten. His legacy lives on in the trails and in the woods and in the streams that he helped save and in the people who visit our properties every single day. Next time you visit the blueberry patch in Charlesburg Valley, I want you to eat a blueberry for Bruce and thank him. Thank you. So few members have had as large and long lasting an impact as Bruce and we are forever grateful for that. Folks, next up is Bob McHugh, our Vice President of Finance, who's going to present the latest financial report, which is very good as you will see, largely as a result of your generosity, which has enabled us to do many great things this year. Thank you all. Bob? Thank you, Bill, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Bob McHugh, the Vice President of Finance. I'm a Fairfield resident. And before I begin, I'd like to remind you, as Alice did, that uh, to use the Q&A button on bar on the lower right-hand side of your uh, computer if you have a question you'd like to submit. Um, the trust finances continue to be strong thanks to your continued support and to Alice and David's uh, diligent management of our daily finances. Our membership remains study about 1,000 members and as usual, we had some turnover. We, uh, there was 193 new members this past year and 184 members chose not to renew. Alice, if you turn the slide, please. So looking at the, the finances for the years, Bill said we had a very, very good year, um, a great year. Uh, total revenues were 1,124,000. Uh, membership giving was up considerably from last year. We had 190,000. $119,000 more given this year than last. Uh, the Patagonia Action Works matching grant program certainly provide an incentive for people to give. And we thank you very much for taking advantage of that. That was a terrific program for those of you who don't want to remember for every dollar that was given under that program, Patagonia matched for a dollar. We received $210,000 of legacy gifts thanks to the generosity of the Storrs family, longtime supporters of the trust and Nancy Lawton. We also received a very generous gift of $50,000 from Christine Knuth to be used towards the Gilberti's Act acquisition. And foundation giving and grants were slightly less than last year. Lastly, we received $178,000 from the Patagonia Action Works matching program as the matching grant. So that was a, a, nice, a nice plus on our side. Expenses totaled $451,000 with no var major variances from the budget. So consequently, we had a small loss from operations, which I define as membership income less expenses. But as a result of legacy gifts, the grants, and the Patagonia match, we ended the year with a surplus of $673,000. $312,000 of the surplus is restricted in use to the acquisition of the Belknap and Gilberti's properties, as well as our Green Corridor initiative. However, we used the remaining $361,000 of the surplus to fund the Gilberti's acquisition this past April, as Bill mentioned. And looking forward to 2020 for the budget, uh, we're planning for a surplus of approximately $77,000. Uh, revenues are budgeted lower as we do not anticipate there being another uh, program such as the Patagonia Works Match. 
And additionally, we do not uh, budget for legacy gifts. Since the budget was set in January though, COVID has introduced a whole new set of challenges for all of us. And we truly hope that you all can continue to support us as you have in the past. We have budgeted $62,000 of restricted grants and $50,000 of unrestricted grants for 2020. However, we expect to exceed these numbers because David and the team have been working very diligently on a number of grant programs and the early indications are we are going to be uh, more than successful in that in that rear. <clears throat> uh, we expect to have carryover spending of approximately $45,000 to remove the man-made dam on the Haskins property. We mentioned to you this uh, last year that the dam is aging and needs to be either uh, removed or repaired and we've been working with the state as to what the best solution will be. And if you turn to the next slide, um, more good news. Uh, you'll see our endowment accounts, uh, the, the markets were very, very strong. Our endowment accounts increased approximately 21% and stood at $3.7 million at year end. And just to remind you, we really have three different endowment accounts uh, with a fourth new uh, holding account. The main account, which is our unrestricted endowment account that we can use towards all of our purposes. The restricted account, which is limited to uh, items that are uh, pertinent to the Haskins property. And the land stewardship fund, which is really something we're trying to build over the long term, is to, to build a fund to help maintain our properties as we acquire more. It's just going to uh, create the need for more resources. And lastly, we established a land account, land acquisition account this past year to hold the funds that are being donated to us to uh, fund these various acquisitions, such as Gilberti's and the Fromps and Strauss property. Um, Jackie, do we have any questions? If not, no, uh, no questions, Bob. Okay, if not, the uh, 2019 annual report is available on our website for those of you who hadn't had a chance to uh, to see to take a uh, read of it. And at this point, I'm going to turn the podium over to. Uh, Jackie Littlejohn, our Vice President of Nominating and Governance. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everyone. I am Jackie Littlejohn, and I'm a Weston resident and Vice President and Chair of the Nominating Committee, and Nominating and Governance Committee, I should say. Anyway, our committee is now comprised of five directors, one representing each of the four primary towns of Weston, Easton, Fairfield, and Westport and also one at-large director who can be from any town. Uh, currently, we include Kirby Brenzel of Weston, Bill Capinzi of Easton, Amy Harlocker of Fairfield, Walter Green of Westport, and myself. So this committee is appointed annually by the executive committee. And among our duties is the recruitment and grooming of potential board members. Critical to the process is being strategic in our search for candidates with particular skill sets needed by our organization at any particular time. We keep a running list of qualified candidates that we have identified, including those who have come recommended to us, and we concern ourselves with which talents are needed and when. Among the many skill sets we seek are first and foremost, a serious interest in land preservation and conservation. But we also need backgrounds in strategic planning, finance, legal, public relations, environmental sciences, land use, fundraising, just to name a few. So we have two retiring directors this year, Lissy Newman and Eile de Bonaventura. They will be so missed on our board, but they're family now. And um, I know they'll be very active supporters going forward. So the board of directors has now proposed the following slate of directors for the class of 2024. And they include Tracy Penoyer of Weston, Ellen Greenberg of Westport, Michelle Fracasso at large in Weston, and Dakin Vanderberg, Easton. And I'd now, each of these candidates, uh, they bring a variety of talents to the land trust, and I'd like to have each of them say a few words about themselves. So, first, how about you, Tracy? Can you unmute yourself? And I'm unmuted. Great. And Show your face. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tracy Penoyer, and I have lived in Weston for the past 25 years with my husband, John Auchincloss. In addition to raising our two children, I am a psychologist with a practice in Westport. I am also the president of the William C. Bullitt Foundation. 
Part of our mission is to protect the natural environment through both land conservation and raising public awareness of environmental threats and solutions. The Aspetuck Land Trust aligns perfectly with this and has been a grantee since our inception. My roots are in New York City, which I still frequent to see family go birding in Central Park and visit youth programs that our foundation funds. These include learning how to farm and maintain community gardens in East New York. When we first moved to Weston, I found that I was outdoors less than in the city. I wasn't used to getting in a car when I left my house. Discovering the Aspetuck Land Trust trails changed that and I have logged many, many miles in the woods with my dog. I have always loved the natural world and I believe that the conservation of land and its wildlife and the preservation of open space is perhaps the most important charge and challenge of our, lifetime, of our time. Once land is developed, it can never be reclaimed. The pandemic has made many more people aware of how crucial it is to have access to nature and open space. Let's hope it is a short-term health emergency, but let's also hope it is a wake-up call to the more serious crisis we face with climate change. Saving land, even small parcels, can be our way of wearing face masks and washing our hands. The Green Carter Initiative that the Aspetuck Land Trust is undertaking is more important than ever. Thank you for the opportunity to work on this and other initiatives to benefit the broader community. And then I've added a PS, for now, don't go to bars and forever don't <laughs> use pesticides. That's my plug. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Thanks. Thanks so much for your support and also that of the Bullet Foundation. It's been very meaningful for us. So next we have Ellen Greenberg. Ellen, can you say a word? Yep. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellen Greenberg. My husband, Paul, and I have lived in Westport for 30 years and we're longtime Aspetuck members. Our children grew up hiking the Aspetuck trails with us. I'm a retired strategic consultant and retired investment banker but currently I'm an enthusiastic amateur gardener. I'm a past president of the Westport Garden Club where I sponsored two large pollinator projects that won state, regional, and national awards. It was natural for me to attend the Talame Lecture in Westport last year. That was the turning point in my involvement with the Land Trust. Doug Talame presents his information so engagingly and convincingly that I knew it was time to make my yard more eco-friendly but I was very frustrated by the limited amount of information that was available on the practical steps to develop a more viable ecosystem in my yard. I looked to the Land Trust for help. I attended several more Aspetuck sponsored lectures on plants and birds and pollinators and got to know David and Mary Ellen. I learned about the Green Corridor, ecotype plants and preserving Gilbertes, as well as many other initiatives in which Aspetuck is involved. I discovered that we had so many interests in common that it seemed natural to offer to help Mary Ellen in her Green Corridor educational goals and longer term to help the trust in its broader initiatives. So I look forward to continuing my work with the trust to learning more myself about these issues and helping to preserve and educate our community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. Gosh, you and, and Paul have been incredible supporters of, of the Land Trust, so we're really excited to have you. Um, so next we have Michelle. Michelle Fracasso, would you say a few words? Good evening. Hi, my name is Michelle Fracasso. I'm an organic farmer in Weston. Um, never, never could I have imagined how our vital, how vital our open spaces and local farms would become to our communities as they have been these past few months. Uh, before starting our family, my husband, Jonathan Spitzer, and I began house hunting from New York City. And we chose our Western property in large part because of its proximity to Trout Brook Valley Preserves Access Road at the end of our street, Wells Hill Road. Together with our 10 and 12 year old daughters, we built and run Wells Hill Farm, which is the last working family farm with livestock in Weston. Pollinator and native plantings have always grown in tandem with our cultivated farmland. Organic farmers struggle daily, daily with the impacts of decline in native pollinator and beneficial insect numbers, which we are losing at a rapid pace due to toxic lawn chemical use, habitat loss, and climate change. 
Part of my mission over the past 14 years has been to support and promote local farms and farmers in Fairfield County. My husband and I have sponsored in various ways the Westport Farmers Market, Reservoir Community Garden, La Chatte Town Farm in Weston, Connecticut NOFA, and programs at the amazing Hickory's Farm of Ridgefield. For the past eight years, I've served on various board positions at Weston's La Chatte Town Farm, and presently I sit on the board of uh, Fairfield County Farm Bureau. I'm a founding member of Weston School District Sustainability Committee. Inspired by the vision of Dan Levinson, we were part of the initial group of investors who partnered to save Gilberti's farm from development. Sal Gilberti is one of the most generous members of our community. He has donated seeds and transplants and his expertise to practically every school, community, and giving garden ever built in Fairfield County. He, from the very start, Sal has farmed with nature in mind. Eswatuck Land Trust's important mission of land conservation and community outreach has been greatly enriched by the Green Corridor and the purchase of Gilberti's farm. And I hope that my skills and service will be of value to Eswatuck Land Trust. Thank you for your consideration this evening. Stay well, everyone. Very impressive, Michelle. Your involvement with the Land Trust is gonna be so valuable, no matter what. So next we have Dakin, Dakin Vanderberg of Easton. Hi everyone, um, thanks for the opportunity to chat and what an impressive set of, uh, of candidates for board positions. I will, uh, I will remain last and least on this list. So I'll try to also be the, the most concise uh, to some extent as well. So I've lived in Easton for the last 10 years. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the Aspatek trails. We've spent uh, many, many, many hours exploring both with dogs and kids and it's clearly an incredible resource. So humbled and excited to be a part of it. Uh, professionally, I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Mass Mutual Trust Company, also the Head of Investments in the Wealth Management arm of Mass Mutual as well. I also spent a number of years running my own firm as an entrepreneur, spent a number of years at Bridgewater, uh, just down the road from us in Easton uh, also. In terms of my involvement, uh, really just hoping to bring lots of energy and uh, I spent a lot of time on obviously the financial side of the equation, but also strategy and thinking about direction, five-year plans, 10-year plans, how we can engage in a bigger, broader way uh, as well. So ecstatic to be involved. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, what an incredible organization to, to have the opportunity to be a part of. So thank you. Thank you, Dakin. We're really looking forward to you being involved in our big plans. So now we've got um, no questions, but it's time for the vote. So on your screen, you'll see the window up here and you can vote for the class of 2024 as presented. You have three options to vote in favor, vote against, or you may abstain. And we're gonna let the count go up. But in the meantime, I want you to know that we have gotten 255 affirmative votes by email already. That preceded our meeting tonight. And now we're, ah, there we go. Okay, so we just got 100% affirmative, 41 votes in our live poll. And that's great. So everyone, the class of 2024 has been accepted as presented. So now I'd like to hand you over to David Brandt, our executive director. Thanks, Jackie. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm not in the audience, <laughs> so I can't see you and I can't see myself. Um, thank you very much. Wow. Um, I'm impressed. What a slate. Um, and what a great board. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity uh, now to thank our incoming class and slate of new board members and uh, returning members of the slate and really thank our entire board. Um, these are a group of volunteers um, that really care about our mission and are volunteering their time. So thank you very much. It's great to work with you guys. And um, <clears throat> it's really impressive. I hope everybody among our membership is equally as impressed as I am. So tonight, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our Green Corridor, which is Alt's Aspatuck Land Trust's big vision for the landscape. <clears throat> Alice, if you would forward the slide. This is what it looks like, not quite from space, but 
from a ways out. It's 40,000 acres. Um, and as I said, it's our big vision uh, for our region. Um, the Green Corridor really has two components, land protection and land stewardship. Land protection is really about saving land. It's the core of any land trust mission. And we've laid out a, really a bold agenda to preserve land in the Green Corridor. And I'm gonna talk more about our progress on this front in a minute. The second component of the Green Corridor is something that's also important, but something that's relatively new to Aspetuck Land Trust. It's primarily focused on stewardship and working with homeowners to change the way that they think about and take care of their yards. It's really a revolutionary concept. It's something that not a lot of land trusts in the country are doing. And it's something that our speaker, Doug Tallamy, knows a lot about and that he's gonna talk a little bit more about. I'm gonna to touch on it very briefly, um, and I'm not gonna belabor, belabor that point uh, when we have an expert here. Um, but first, I wanna give our members really an update on our land protection efforts uh, that Bill, uh, our president, referenced in his introduction, and talk a little bit more about the criteria that we use to geolocate the actual green corridor in the landscape. Um, but you can see our corridor here uh, laid out in the landscape and there's a few different colors, there's a few different shades. Um, the primary criteria that we were concerned about that drove the, the geolocation of our corridor is really protecting the land around riparian corridors. Uh, you can see on the far eastern side of the corridor is where the Mill River uh, can be found. Um, the Mill River uh, is an important area. Uh, it contains a number of properties that we uh, that we already have, that we've already protected. Uh, it, it, it includes a wild trout management area, one of only a few in the state where there's a naturally recurring brook trout population. If you go over into Fairfield and you can see a lot of these yellow properties masked in this yellow area and, and the red area, um, the Sasko Brook comes down and it's uh, adjoining tributaries. And over here south of the Saugatuck Reservoir is where the Saugatuck River starts and where it flows down into Long Island Sound. So protecting the land around those riparian corridors was really important for us and was really a primary kind of logic underlying where we put the Green Corridor. The other thing we wanted to do is really link existing Aspetuck Land Trust properties and other nature preserves. So they're owned by the Nature Conservancy, uh, the towns, the state, uh, that was important to us. And we wanted to link habitats of rare flora and fauna, uh, so rare plants and animals. And again, where there's water, there is life. And a lot of those areas really exist around the riparian corridors, the rivers and the streams. Um, we wanted to avoid and mitigate the effects of habitat fragmentation. Um, it's really <laughs> what the Green Corridor is all about. Um, and we wanted to protect important farmland soils not so important down here in the south where it's mostly developed, uh, but it, it becomes more important up in East End and certain parts of Weston. We heard from Michelle, who is the last farmer in Weston. And up here uh, where you can see this yellow property on the Northeast is where Gilberti's farm is. And it does contain important farmland soils. And you know these are very important uh, for our local sustainability. All in all, We've identified, and these are the yellow properties on the map, a total of 42 properties uh, that encompass 805 acres. And as I said, this is a big and a bold vision for our landscape. We felt that it was important to create some excitement and some energy around land protection. And um, we think the Green Corridor is gonna do that. So moving on to the next slide, We've had some land protection wins. Um, as Bill Krakel mentioned, uh, we protected Gilberti's farm in Easton this year. Uh, it was a project that we worked long and hard on. Uh, we were really, you know, you know, following through with the original investors, uh, you know, uh, help of, of Sal and Dan Levinson in protecting this farm. And we were able to, to purchase it. And we're leasing to Sal Gilberti, who you can see here. Uh, I assume many of you know Sal, eaten his products. He's holding up a, a box of his uh, petite 
edibles, which is a micro salad greens product that he grows at the farm. Um, he also grows potted herbs for sale at garden centers throughout the eastern seaboard. Um, you know, this is the largest certified organic greenhouse in the Northeast. I didn't know that until a few months ago. Um, it's really a, a big economic driver and a, an important kind of link in our local food system. And we're just really excited to have preserved this farm. Our main goal is to see this ag enterprise successful. Um, and uh, while well, Sal's there, and when Sal is not there, uh, we want to keep it as a working farm. We do not have public access on this farm because it is a working farm. And uh, uh, it's just not appropriate. Um, but we're looking into how we can utilize the farm as a community resource moving forward. Um, just want to mention that the farm is adjacent to our 34 acre Randall's Farm Preserve, uh, which was preserved in 2010. Uh, it was donated to Aspentuck Land Trust uh, by Joan DuPont. That was a project that Bruce LePage worked on for many years. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, we're creating a 70 acre agricultural block, uh, which is just pretty neat. Um, another land protection win uh, that Bill mentioned is our forest block assemblage project in Weston and Wilton. And it really is just that, it's an assemblage project. Um, we've been working on this for a number of years. Um, it's a big puzzle piece. Uh, it's located in an area of, uh, along the Weston Wilton border that really is the last frontier of open space in our region. It's an incredibly exciting project. Um, we've been picking off properties for a number of years over there. Um, they really kind of center around our Honey Hill Preserve, which you can see in orange. So Aspetuck Land Trust properties are colored orange. Um, we, you can see the trail network uh, in that orange Honey Hill uh, Preserve. And I think it's interesting to note that the first property we protected in that matrix uh, was in 1968. Um, and we're continuing uh, to add to it to create literally a 705 acre forest block um, where all the yellow properties are properties that we are currently working on protecting. They're all in various stages of uh, kind of process. Um, we're currently working on the Fromson Strassler property, which you can see in the Northeast. It's the largest property in the forest block. Um, it provides a really unique opportunity for us, uh, not only because it's the biggest property in the block, but it will provide uh, access uh, at a, through a central trailhead at the end of Upper Parish Drive. We're working with the town of Weston, um, which has been a great working relationship uh, to protect this property. They actually own it. Um, Aspetuck Land Trust has raised over a million dollars so far this year for this property, um, and it's just really a, a keystone property in the forest block. Um, we're working on this project as it is on the Western Wilton border with the Wilton Land Conservation Trust. Um, you can see they own protected land in the south, kind of the pea green property down there uh, that's connected to a town of Wilton open space. And the forest block actually extends further south than, than you can see on this map. Uh, but we wanted to give you a sense for the scope of the project and for what it looks like kind of on its northern tier and the solar plexus really um, uh, of the forest block. So if you remember, the second component of the Green Corridor is land stewardship, um, land protection and land stewardship. We talked a little bit about our efforts on the land protection front and highlighted a couple properties and projects that we're working on, uh, which we can't do uh, without support from our members. Uh, Alice, if you would please forward to the next slide. We're working with homeowners, as I said, to change the way they think about and take care of their yards. Um, you know, Aspetuck Land Trust can't preserve all the land in our towns. Um, I wish we could, but we can't. Um, what exists in between Aspetuck Land Trust protected open spaces, uh, in between town protected open spaces, state protected open spaces, in our region, um, in our four town regional land trust region, in the Green Corridor, really are homeowners. Um, so they are, homeowners are really the connective tissue in between our protected open spaces. And as such, they really play a very important role uh, in our landscape. And so we've laid out a program um, with the help of Mary Ellen LeMay, our Director of Landowner Engagement, um, to really educate and inspire landowners to take these steps. Um, you may have heard of the pollinator pathways. They're expanding throughout the Northeast. Uh, they've engendered a lot of enthusiasm and energy. The Green Corridor is a pathway. It is a pollinator pathway. 
it's a pollinator pathway that kind of incorporates land protection and stewardship. And that's really important to us. Um, and we're asking uh, homeowners to do three things. And remember, homeowners are landowners. You know, I'm a homeowner. My wife and I own a home in Fairfield. We don't really think of ourselves as landowners. Many homeowners don't, but we are. We're landowners. And we own the most of the land in the Green Corridor. So homeowners are very important. We're asking people to plant native plants. Doug's going to talk a little bit more about the importance of that. We're asking people to rethink their lawn. Mary Ellen sent me a picture of a clover island, which I think is pretty cool. And you can see that in the center of this picture um, above the Rethink Your Lawn title. Um, you can let your lawn grow a little longer than you normally do so it uses less water and you increase your, the strength of your roots. Um, you can switch to an organic landscape company, lawn company. Uh, you can overseed your whole lawn with clover. You can rip up a part of your lawn and plant native plants like I did on the far left picture um, uh, where I removed some grass on both sides of my front entryway and planted these beautiful native plants, which I just love. And the third thing we're asking homeowners to do is really try to avoid pesticides and herbicides. Um, you know, it seems like an easy thing to do and you spray a little herbicide, you spray a little pesticide down your yard, but it, you know, they don't stay in your yard. They migrate, they go to your neighbor and they go to your neighbor's neighbor. So it's really something that we're asking people to avoid so that our friends, the butterflies and the bees can uh, have a better chance of making it. Um, so we're very, really quite excited about this effort. And we've created a way for homeowners to get involved through our Green Corridor Partnership Program. Alice, if you would advance, thank you. Um, you've seen this sign hopefully around town. I was walking with my kids the other day. We were taking the dogs for a walk and my son lo and behold pointed out, hey dad, there's a green corridor sign. And it just really made me smile. And I think uh, I, the plants look new. And I think uh, it was a few blocks down the, down the street, they, uh, they, this family bought plants at our native plant sale and they, signed up to become Green Quarter Partners. They, we sent them a sign, they planted their plants, and uh, boy, it was something to see. So our goal is uh, 500 people this year uh, to sign up to be Green Quarter Partners. We already have over 250 people, many of them land trust members. We'd like to have all of our land trust members become Green Quarter Partners. So if you're not, please go to our website, click on homeowners, take the Green Quarter Pledge, and we'll send you this beautiful sign. Um, but it's really just a great way for you to show what you're doing to really repair the world, uh, which is what we're really talking about here. Um, uh, you can see the far right picture is a, a land trust member in Fairfield um, who literally turned her whole front yard into a meadow. And it's quite stunning. But you can do little things, uh, about like plant a mailbox garden uh, and, uh, and or any number of other things. And our website's a great resource for you to go to. Uh, and the public uh, to see what those things are. So what have we done over the past year? We've done a lot. Mary Allen has done a lot of work. We've all done a lot of work. Uh, we think we're making progress. Uh, Alice, if you could advance to the next slide, please. We're building model native landscapes. Um, we think people need to see and touch and feel um, the future. Uh, these native plants. Uh, we want people to see firsthand what they can do in their own yard. So we created a, a model native landscape at Earth Place. Uh, it's not the plants on the right or some of the plants that we put in there uh, with Jay Petro and Petro Design. Uh, we're building a model native landscape at our Carol and Edna Haskins Preserve in Westport this fall. Um, we're creating, building another model native landscape at our Southport Wildflower Preserve as well. A little teeny property right across the street from the entrance to Pequot Library. Um, so we think these are going to be very helpful uh, and they're going to be uh, great places to engage the public in doing this work. Alice, would you please forward to the next slide? We've also hosted 24 educational workshops over the past year. Mary Ellen LeMay has been out there inspiring, engaging, and educating our public, the public, um, to do this work. Um, so we're putting energy out there, we're putting information out there, and we're, we're really trying to make this happen. We're trying to create a snowball that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and trying to 
trying to change the way people think, as I said, about their yards and what they're doing in their yards. Fairfield County is a unique place. We've got a lot of golf course lawns. Um, we're not saying that your lawns are bad. Um, I have a lawn. I reduced a little bit of my lawn, um, but that we can, we can do some other things in our lawns to help wildlife, to help build biodiversity, to help, you know, really uh, ameliorate, help fix some of the problems we see, um, you know, in our landscape uh, with the loss of uh, insects over 50% since the 70s, uh, billions of birds lost since the 70s. And this is really driven, as Doug is going to talk about, by our lack of diversity in our suburban landscapes. Um, Alice, if you could forward to the next slide. One thing that we've done, and uh, this, is, this is my last slide, is um, we've built this landscape professional partnership program. And this is something that we've had a, a volunteer work with us on, uh, Ted Huber um, from Westport, a trail steward at our Carol, uh, trail steward at our Carol and Edna Haskins Preserve, and Mary Ellen have really done a great job putting this together. You know, Aspeduct Land Trust is a small little land trust. Um, we can only do so much. Uh, you know, the bully pulpit that we have, though we are a relatively large land trust in the state um, with 1,100 members, uh, we can only push this out so much. So we need help. Uh, we need landscape companies. Uh, that can help push this program out. So we have collected, we've recruited, uh, we've engaged these particular local companies uh, to be a part of our Landscape Professional Partnership Program to help educate and inspire uh, you know, this work in our community. Quite frankly, they see a market here. Um, they see new businesses. People want to go organic. People want to plant native plants. People want to do things differently in their yards to heal the planet, to make a difference. Um, but, you know, they also are doing this work already. And, you know, we're successful if we're able to give them more business. <laughs> if they're successful, we're going to be successful in our efforts. So these are the beginning companies in this movement to change our landscapes. And I just want to thank them for being involved with us. And they're listed on our website. And they're people that you can call, that the public can call to get this started. This is just the beginning. Of, of building this snowball. And these are the first uh, landscape leaders that have stepped up to help. So I just wanna thank them very much. So with that, I do want to introduce our very exciting speaker, Doug Tallamy, who you may have heard last fall at our Haskins lecture. But if we could go to the next slide for Doug, thank you. Uh, maybe Doug's starting to put his slides up, but I do wanna say, Nobody's done more to inspire people to make these changes in their yards than Doug Tallamy. Um, he is, I call him the guru of backyard biodiversity. Doug, I, I hope you're okay with that. Um, nah, I'm not a guru. <laughs> <laughs> he knows a lot about this kind of stuff. That's what I'll say. And um, I've learned a lot from him and he has really inspired Aspetuck Land Trust um, and other land trusts and other people throughout this country to do this important work. Um, and so I'm really pleased and I want to thank Doug for joining us tonight uh, from Delaware. Um, take it away, Doug. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, I want to expand on what, what uh, David was talking about, but before I do that, I want to emphasize what the Espetuck Land Trust is, is doing. They have a vision. It's a very big vision for the landscapes within the Green Carter. And in fact, the land, the land Trust is leading the effort to save the life around us, and they're doing that by saving the land around us. You've got to do that before its ecological integrity is, is destroyed. So I want to thank the Espetuck Land Trust personally, but we all need to thank them because the work they're doing is, uh, it's vital to all of us. It's essential. And that's why I want to talk to you a little bit tonight to try to convince you that it is essential. Uh, and I don't have a lot of time to do that, so we have to compress an awful lot of, of ideas. One of them is that, that nature really is comprised of a series of very specialized relationships. But the way we humans blunder around the, the environment, we, um, we haven't thought about that and we tend to break up those relationships. Uh, so that means that the relationships in nature itself uh, is, is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes primarily because we have not taken Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. 
and Teddy got wind of that. So he went to the canyon and he stood on its, its lip and he looked out over uh, the wonderful scenery and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process for creating the Grand Canyon National Park. It was easier back then. The problem today, though, of course, is that we don't have the opportunity to leave most of the United States as, as it was um, because there's only 5%, a generous 5% that is left in anything close to its original pristine ecological state. Uh, and that's because we've, we've logged it and we've tilled it and we've drained it and we've grazed it and paved it and otherwise <laughs> developed it. We have straightened our rivers and we have dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our atmosphere and changed the climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, which are now running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up the natural world into little, little fragments of its former self that are too small and too isolated to sustain and by sustain, I don't mean for five years, I mean essentially forever to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that support us. And we've done all these things because we thought our nest, planet Earth, was so big that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were, we were wrong about that. And here are the headlines that David was talking about, uh, you know, the global insect decline, insect apocalypse is here. We've lost three billion birds in North America in just the last 50 years. As a matter of fact, the UN predicts we're going to lose a million species on the earth in the next 20 years. I could go on uh, with, with these horrible statistics, but that's not my goal tonight. Um, I'm not here to talk about the, the, the pox that we visited upon the earth and thus upon all of our, our houses. I want to talk about a cure for that pox. And it's a cure that will uh, involve a little bit of effort from a lot of people. But that effort will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to all the people. Let's return to this headline briefly. Insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, way back in 1987, E.O. Wilson, a uh, very famous biologist from Harvard, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects. Life as we know it depends almost entirely on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. About 90% of our flowering plants would go extinct, which would change, it would alter energy flow through our, our terrestrial habitats so drastically that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot due to the loss of, of insect decomposers. And of course, humans would not survive any of those, those changes. The good news though, is that we can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But in order to do that, we're gonna to have to do the types of things that the Aspetuck Land Trust is, is engaged in. We're going to have to change the way we landscape to accomplish those goals. Why? Well, let me just remind you, you know, humans are a product of nature. We are part of it. We are not separate from it. And we cannot live without it because we depend on what we call ecosystem services. These are just a few of the services that we get from, from plants. How about oxygen? important. They clean our water and slow its journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important uh, today. Plants build our topsoil and hold it in place. They prevent floods. They dampen severe weather, on and on and on. What do animals do for us? Well, they primarily keep those plants happy. They provide pest control services for the, for the plants. They pollinate nearly 90% of them. They disperse plant seeds. Uh, and many other things. So designing landscapes for humans that destroy those ecosystem services really is not a, a long-term option. It's not even a short-term option. Now, there have been people throughout history who have recognized uh, that we don't have a healthy relationship with, uh, with the land. And one of the most famous, of course, is Aldo Leopold, wrote the uh, Sand County Almanac. Uh, he recognized very early on that, that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Uh, and I have to say, we're not very good at, we're not very good at doing that. So Alda had a dream. He called it the land ethic. Um, he recognized that we have to use the land. We have to farm it and lumber it and graze it and mine it and hunt on it. But he said, we have to learn to do that without destroying local ecosystems. What has always, um, it surprised me. 
Dalla was a deep thinker, but he never talked about developing a land ethic where we actually live. It was always someplace else. And I'm not sure why that was, but I'm guessing that the, the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist was so deeply embedded in, in the culture then, and it's still deeply embedded in our culture today, that Aldo Leopold didn't recognize it as an option. Well, I'm gonna argue that uh, living with nature not only is an option, it is now probably the only viable option that is left to us. We simply have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes or we will lose it and in turn lose ourselves. So where are we gonna start? We're gonna start with those lands landscapes that David was talking about. How about privately owned land? 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is in private hands. We cannot ignore private property if we're gonna succeed in conservation. What are we gonna conserve? Well, we're trying to rebuild nature in areas where we've already ripped it apart. And we have to do that for all parts of nature, but not all parts are equally important. So we wanna focus on the most important aspects, the building blocks of nature first. And in terms of, of supporting food webs, uh, it turns out that caterpillars really are essential in terms of passing the energy from, from plants to other animals. Caterpillars transfer more energy from plants than any other type of, of uh, living being. Uh, and that means if you take caterpillars out of the environment, you have locked up the energy in plants uh, and, and then you lose everything else. Let me give you a, a few quick examples. Carolina chickadees, we've, we've studied them for some time. Uh, they rear their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. And it turns out that's true for, for most uh, birds out there. Um, which means if you take the caterpillars away, uh, you're, you're going to lose the chickadees. They're not optional members of the, the chickadee diet. They're essential members of the chickadee diet. How many caterpillars are we talking about here? Well, thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadee. And again, this is typical for, for uh, I guess it's 96% of the birds in, in uh, North America, which means we have to build landscapes that make caterpillars if we want birds. Birds are indi uh, ecological indicators, by the way. If you don't have birds, you do not have a healthy ecosystem. Things are going downhill quickly. So we need to landscape for caterpillars. How do we do that? Well, we have to add, we add caterpillars to the landscapes by adding the plants that make those caterpillars, which sounds easy, but there is a catch. And that is that all plants don't make caterpillars equally. So we have to add the plants that are good at it. Turns out that most caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat. They can only eat particular plants. So we have to add the plants that support the caterpillars, as many caterpillar species as we can, which means plant choice matters. You can't just pick any old plant from around the world. And I could expand on this for, for another hour, but I don't have time. So I'm just gonna give you some examples of um, homeowners, people who have done this right in the middle of suburbia. Let's start with, with Margie and Dan Terpstra, who live in um, a little suburb of St. Louis. Uh, their yard, they've got, I think, 0.6 acres was thoroughly invaded with um, bush honeysuckle. It's the major invasive species out there. So the first thing they did was, was uh, get rid of the, the honeysuckle. Then they planted a whole bunch of native plants. They also put in a, a water feature that they called a bubbler, uh, Kirkwood, Missouri, that's where they live. Um, so they installed this bubbler, they, they put in the, the native plants and they have recorded 149 bird species right in their, their yard, 35 warbler species. At, at my house, we've got 10 acres in, in uh, Southeast Pennsylvania. We've only recorded eight species. Um, so the, the uh, turfsters are doing really well with their little property right there in the middle of suburbia. Can this work in urban yards? <clears throat> well, let's go to Pam Carlson's yard who lives in Chicago. As a matter of fact, she lives right next to the uh, Chicago O'Hare Airport, right next to one of the runways. Uh, and this is what her, her backyard looks like. She lives on one tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average US lot. <clears throat> Again, it's, it's right in the middle of Chicago, a half block from the Kennedy Expressway. Uh, there's absolutely no connectivity with uh, her property and any preserved land. Uh, but she has added 60 native plant species and a water feature to her yard and has recorded 116 species of birds, including a woodcock. If you wanna see a woodcock, go to, uh, go to Chicago and stop by Pam's yard. 
Uh, I could go on, there's lots of examples. Um, every time somebody puts in the powerful native plants that support the life around them, that life comes. This really does work. But there are three keys uh, to success that I think we need to focus on. And David mentioned one of them. Uh, let's start with the lawn. We have to shrink the area that is in lawn because we've got too much of it. We got over 40 million acres of lawn, which is now bigger than the area of New England. Uh, so I suggest, and the lawn of course is, is a deadscape. It's not, it's not supporting anything. It looks nice, but it's not supporting anything. So I'm proposing that we cut that area in half. If we replant half the area that's now in lawn, we have 20 million acres to work with. And if we do it at home, we can call this new acreage, homegrown national park, which will be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, that's still less than 20 million acres. So if we create homegrown national park, we're gonna have the biggest park in, in the country. Second important point that we need to think about is uh, that not all native plants are equal in their ability to support the life around us. We found that um, just 5% of our native plants, and this, this is true anywhere in the country, are making or producing about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives these, these food webs. And I'm calling these, these plants keystone plants. So we need to build our, the, the, uh, um, the ecosystem in our yard out of these keystone plants. And then we can diversify. Once we have these plants in place, we can diversify with other plants. Um, so again, I wanna emphasize, it's not just native versus non-native. We have to pick the most powerful natives in order to succeed. Here's the most powerful native uh, in, in, the, uh, um, in Connecticut, in the entire mid-Atlantic region, uh, actually in the entire country, it's oaks. Genus Quercus, 557 species of caterpillars just in the mid-Atlantic states, and that includes Connecticut. Uh, if you compare it to a typical non-native tree like, like ginkgo that supports zero caterpillars, the choice of which plant you're gonna put in your yard ought to be pretty obvious. So where do you find out what the keystone species are for, for uh, your, the county you live in, wherever it may be? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the ranked list of woody and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. They're ranked in terms of the number of caterpillar species that they support. Um, so these are the, the uh, top ranked uh, woody plants, woody plant genera, and here are the top ranked herbaceous plant genera. But you know, it's a big list. It goes, goes down for, for lots of species. So very hand, handy tool. Um, the old excuse of I don't know what to plant uh, is gone. We do know what to plant now. The third important point is that using keystone species in your yard works, but only if you don't have a big problem from light pollution. Uh, it turns out that, that lights are a major cause of insect declines around the world. They kill insects in all these different ways by exhausting them, colliding with uh, red hot bulbs and then incinerating them, dehydration. Predators know to go to lights and pick off those insects. It blinds the insects uh, and, and does a number of other things. So having lights in your yard, um, it's a one-way trip for most of the insects that go to those lights. Three ways to reduce that. If you need a security light uh, at your, your house, put a motion sensor on your security light. So it only turns on when the bad man comes. And the first thing you're gonna realize is that the bad man doesn't come very often. Next most important thing you can do is use a yellow light bulb. They're far, yellow, yellow color is far less attractive to insects and the least attractive type of light is a yellow LED bulb. We could, we could slash uh, insect mortality almost overnight just by changing our, our light bulbs and outdoor lighting. We've made, uh, at least in my opinion, we've made three missteps in the early years of, of conservation. And early years, uh, I would say, is the last century. And the first is that we've assumed that, that nature's important, but not essential. You know, we like it, but, but we don't really need it. I was at the Cincinnati Zoo not all that long ago, um, well, pre-virus, and this was a wall size uh, uh, poster that, you know, I see this and you hear this all, all, the, all the time. We need to save nature for future generations. We want our kids to appreciate uh, the natural world. But to me, that suggests that we're saving nature um, for entertainment, valuable entertainment, but it's just for entertainment. 
It's much more important than that. We need to save wildlife. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. Sounds dramatic, but it's true. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now I mentioned this, but um, if we follow that assumption, then we restrict conservation efforts to the areas where there aren't any humans. And believe me, that's not very many areas these days, which means we've condemned those efforts to ultimate failure because those, the areas we're conserving then would be too small and too isolated from each other in order to, to succeed in the long run. David Quammen has an excellent uh, analogy between ecosystems and a Persian rug. This is a, a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is 71 scraps, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And that of course is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every place has ecological significance, including your yard. So what we need to do, as David suggests, is put the plants back in our human dominated landscapes, including where we live, where we work, where we play, and connect all of those isolated fragments, all of the places that the Aspetuck Land Trust is working to preserve. So that not only do we have connectivity where plants and animals can move back and forth, but they can also live in these new habitats that we're creating, which means with us. Our third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship to a few specialists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of, of every human being on the planet. And I, I don't know why, because every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystem. Who, who does not need a healthy environment? So that means every person, uh, in my view anyway, has the responsibility of good Earth stewardship. And I sure wish we were teaching that from, from birth on. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. Now, I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. Um, and, and that's important. Um, there, you know, there are huge environmental issues out there today that uh, a single person, it'd be very difficult for a single person to make a noticeable difference. If I said to you, I want you to solve climate change and I want to see the results tomorrow, um, it'd be tough. We wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do that. But if I said, I want you to plant an oak tree and I want to see it tomorrow, you could do it. I could see it and we could all immediately see the things that start to use that oak tree. So this, uh, this empowers each one of us to be an important component of the future of conservation. And it also shrinks the problem to something that's manageable. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems that you'll get overwhelmed immediately. Just worry about the land you own. Get rid of the invasive species, shrink your lawn, plant those, those powerhouse plants. Um, build a pollinator garden. That's it. If everybody does that, we're 85% we're uh, done. So as property owners, or if you don't own property as, as a volunteer, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. And whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate. So here's, here's a message from my grandchildren. You are nature's best hope. Thanks very much. Does anyone have any questions they want to line up in the q a i see a page lion says is there a way to involve large-scale developers well sure we have to talk to them um you know i go around and i talk to a lot of people but it's always people who invite me and large-scale developers never have um but they're selling a product uh, if, if everybody refused to buy a home that wasn't uh, landscaped in the way we're talking about, developers would catch on very quickly. And you know, the, the needle is moving. There are more and more uh, townships that are requiring a higher percentage of native plants and new developments. Um, the entire culture is changing. I, I've been, been at this for more than 10 years and I can see um, noticeable differences. The demand for native plants uh, from, from uh, the general public, but also in, in uh, large-scale landscaping is through the roof. So I do see a culture shift uh, and developers, developers, developers will follow that eventually, but it's market driven. So we as, as home buyers uh, get to demand what, what, uh, and what we're going to settle for. Great. We have one other question. Alice, Eli? ask, what do you recommend is the best choice for replacing a lot of burning bush? 
wing do you want in this? Here in dear country, so many, or so much I have tried to use has been demolished. Yeah, but <laughs> deer, uh, deer are a terrible problem. It, and, and they've encouraged the invasive species problem like, like burning bush and, and bush honeysuckle and all the things that the deer don't, don't eat. Tips the competitive balance against the, the natives. But landscaping with plants that deer won't eat isn't going to solve the problem because they're also plants largely that the insects that drive the ecosystems won't eat. Um, I mean, we, I could say, well, plant uh, a bunch of spice bush and the deer don't like it. And if you look at the understories uh, in, in so many places, that's about the only native plant that's there. But we need a diversity of, of native plants. So the real solution that you're, at, you're looking for here is to control our deer problem. We need to get the numbers down. Uh, but witch hazel is, is another good one that uh, deer don't, don't um, they certainly don't favor, but I will tell you a hungry, a hungry deer eats anything, anything. Um, the understory of a lot of, a, a healthy understory is comprised of not just shrubs. I mean, I'd recommend viburnum, but the, the deer certainly do like viburnum. But a healthy understory is comprised of young trees, young canopy trees that are waiting their chance to, to um, take off. So black cherry is a very important canopy tree and deer typically, uh, they will eat it, but only when they're very hungry, they don't like that very much. Uh, and it will sit there as a small tree in a shaded area for, for quite a while. But we can't ignore the, the oaks and the hickories and the, and the walnuts and the other things that, that deer do eat. Um, while we're getting rid of the, of the uh, burning bush. So it is a conundrum. Um, when I try to keep something around at home, I, I use, I don't fence the whole property. I just use a deer cage until it's up past the point where it can handle some, some deer herbivory. But I won't minimize the problem. It's a huge, it's a huge issue. So I see one other question from Jackie B and she says, we should find ways to make lists of keystone species brief and available. Not sure if that's a question or a statement. Could you read it again? We should find ways to make lists of keystone species oh. brief and available. Right. Well, that's what that website is supposed to be for. You, any c county in the entire country has access to the list of, of uh, the top ranked plant. Of course, the ones at the beginning of the list are, are the keystone plants. Um, could it be more user friendly? I'm sure it, I'm sure it could be. Uh, and we're trying to, to improve um, access to it and how easily uh, you can use it. Um, you know, uh, that's beyond my, my area of expertise, but um, you certainly can make those lists available locally. Uh, and I'm sure the land trust can do that for you. Right, David? <laughs> that's right. We, and we have a list of native plants that we've compiled on our website as well that Mary Ellen has put together. Um, so we do have lists. There you go. For some plants. Jackie B. just also said the NWF website is uh, oh, certainly could be much more user friendly. Well, mm. we're going to help. We're going to help you, Jackie. So keep in touch. Any other questions out there? Okay, here we go. Jill Brandt wants to know, Sydney Brandt is curious when the off-leash dog, tra oh, <laughs> off dog trail will reopen. Well, we're going to address that soon, Sydney. So hold on and... Any more questions for Doug? That presentation is always so valuable. Anyone? Thank you, Doug. So I guess okay. now, David. I want to thank Doug so much for coming in and visiting with us again and, and inspiring us to continue our Green Corridor effort. And um, David and I wanted to take a few questions from members, you know, about anything that they've heard tonight and Jackie and, uh, and uh, Bob will sort of answer questions as well, but we wanted to invite members and I guess we've already gotten our first question. Okay, Sydney says he's curious when the off-leash dog trail will reopen. All right, and as I said earlier, you know, when we charted our, 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 our strategy for COVID-19, you know, we had to take, um, very careful assessment of the number of people who would be coming in, how we would have some social distancing and how we would make sure that we didn't have uh, dogs, you know, who, who don't understand social distancing, um, you know, sort of threatening the health and safety of our visitors. And I think Joe Schneerlein, our land 
management vice president said it best, you know, dogs don't understand the notion of, of social distancing. So we um, asked people not to bring their dogs. And uh, recently we have reopened the, uh, the, the blue and white trail at Troutbrook Valley for leash dogs. And uh, the board is gonna take the, uh, the, the notion of, of, of dogs up again at our meeting. It's going to immediately follow this meeting. So we are, 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 are very interested in bringing back dogs. You know, our first obligation is to uh, protect and conserve our, our open space lands and also to ensure the health and safety of the people who visit those lands. And that's what we're going to use in order to, to gauge what our future strategy with respect to dogs. But we expect that we will open up for, for, for more dogs. And uh, we're gonna talk about that next and you'll hear about it within the next couple of weeks. David? Well, I didn't think my daughter was gonna ask that question, but she does ask me every week, when can I take, we can take the dogs uh, off leash? And I told her basically what you said, Bill, and we've been walking our dog, uh, you know, on the streets, but you know, as Bill said, it's an issue that, you know, we take very seriously and uh, we have a lot of people on our board who have dogs. Uh, we have three of them in our family. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think the board is doing the best job that they can in a, in a challenging circumstance. And if I may say, at some point, Jack and May. we actually just counted among our board members how many dogs we have, and I think there are 13. So, um, you know, we're as affected as everyone else is. So we're just trying to do the right thing here. So we have a question. Hold on a second. Or someone raise their hand. Let's see. Yeah, I can uh, allow the folks who have their raised hands to speak. So um, let's see, Moto G, you don't have your name on here, but I'm going to allow you to talk. So go ahead. Yeah, we'll come back to you. So Tim, you have your hand raised. So go ahead and speak, please. He's got his mute. Yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted to, I thank David on email, but I just want to thank everyone in this organization for keeping the properties open which was so important during the early part of the pandemic to do hiking and keep our sanity and all this. And I also want to say that I recently uh, rode my bike up uh, Morehouse Road to the, the new property to check it out. And it's fantastic. And thank you guys for everything you do. You're welcome. Thank you. So there's one from an anonymous attendee. Are there any plans to keep some trails open for only leash dogs going forward? So we are going to take that up immediately after this meeting and we will, we will let you all know within the next week or so how we're going to deal with leashed and uh, perhaps unleashed dogs as well. But um, clearly it's on our agenda. Next up. I think that's it, guys. Well, that's good. So let us um, get to the final, the final closing of our of our meeting here. And as Jackie mentioned, Lucy Newman's and Eileen Devonaventura's board terms are coming to an end. And I want to express our gratitude to both Lucy and Eileen for their service to the Aspetuck Land Trust and their influence on our board and its work. They will be missed as as as. Uh, as Jackie said, but we look forward to their continued counsel, warmth, and generosity in the coming years. As a token of our appreciation, they will both be receiving paintings by John Forgion. And, and Alice, maybe you can flash them up. And um, we want to offer them both the opportunity to say a few parting words. And I thought I would start with Eileen. Eileen? Hi, can you hear me? I see you. Oh, good, yes. great. Well, thanks, Bill. I just want everyone to know that I've really cherished um, my time being a part of this fantastic organization. Um, I remember when Princey asked me to become a member of the board, Bruce LePage was the executive director, and she described the land trust as a sleepy little land trust, and I can tell you we're far from that now. And I'm really proud of the 13 years that I've put in um, on the board, and as a former you know, head of the nominating and government governance committee. I know the board is 
all set to do really well by the land trust. And um, I just want to thank the board for this fabulous painting. I'm going to cherish it so much. And um, I hope to see you out in the blueberry preserves and I hope to um, be, become a trail steward. And don't hesitate to call on me if you need me for any committee work. I'm there for you. Thank you so Thanks. much, Eileen. Thanks, Eileen. Lucy, would you like Thanks, to say any words? Um, oh my gosh, can you hear me? Am I good? I'm such a Luddite, can you, you hear can. me? Yeah, we can see you and hear it's you. Amazing. First of all, I have to show my painting. And anyone who knows uh, what my house looks like, I'm really glad it's a tiny and perfect thing because I actually have a spot for it. It's gorgeous. I, I was super thrilled, loved it, Love my jam. Um, you're not getting rid of me. There, there's so much I wanna say and I'm really gonna try to keep it short, but I do have to say like, I've never been so proud to be a land trust member as especially recently. Um, I was very boots on the ground in the beginning. We were smaller, we've grown. It's amazing. I came in at Troutbrook Valley and, um, but I just have to say that recently I, you know, the kind of hit that our preserves have been taking with so many different people. I mean, I've seen people, I saw a woman with like false eyelashes, full Sunday best walking in the woods. And it was a beautiful thing. A lot of people that I've never seen before walking in the woods. Um, and I hope they just continue to do it. Um, we have a really difficult mandate mandate. I just want to tell all of our members, you know, it's a really super hard balance to balance the, the dual mandate of preserving land and also encouraging people to go out on the land. And I, I really encourage our members to understand how, how difficult it is to maintain that balance. And I assure you that um, our, our discussions, our board discussions are, you know, they're passionate, they're sometimes even a little heated, but also super well informed. Um, we're balancing the science and the needs of people. It's difficult. It's a great board. We all get along. We've done it. it's, it's amazing. I've never, I'm so, so happy to have been a part, member of this board. And luckily I'm not going anywhere. So I'm still gonna be here. And as a parting um, word, I would like to say that really encourage the board to, um, to, to branch out into communities of color and benefiting areas where there are, are people of color that can benefit from our properties and or just trying to bring people, pre people in and, and you know, let those properties work for everybody in all of our surrounding communities. And I think we're, I think we're gonna do that. So, um, and when people ask me if I'm a, a board member, I might lie and just say I still am, but you know, <laughs> no one's getting to, I mean, I can say I'm a member, I'll be a member forever. So thank member you guys so me. much, really. And also love the incoming slate. I'm like, what an amazing, you know, every, that's like, they're gonna rock it. So there you go. Thank you so much, Lissy. David? Anything else you want to add? Um, well, I just want to thank Lissy and Eileen, and I've worked with you guys for a long time, and uh, I know how committed you are and um, to the land trust, our mission, and uh, no, um, I will not let you go uh, uh, off without <laughs> continuing to try to engage you both. So I have, I have plans for both of you, and uh, I'm really psyched that you're going to still stay involved with, with the land trust. So thank you again. We'll miss you. Miss you. Miss you. So that completes our virtual annual meeting and we appreciate your joining us, of course, and your continuing support of our programs. Um, it's very, very important to us. And if you have questions or comments, please contact David, me, or any board member and we'll be happy to respond. And lastly, our website is our portal to the world. So please visit it often get information and give us information at the same time. Um, we get a lot of good stuff there and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you and good night.